Okay, so as you just heard, welcome to our presentation, Quality Improvement Along the Patient Journey. Uh, this presentation is being recorded in video format by AHS and the recording may be used and disclosed by AHS for educational purposes and further broadcast for other presentations, publications and promotions. And that might include conversion to digital format, storing and publication on an AHS webcasting technology. So I'm Justine Turner, your moderator today, and your panelists you will hear from today are Jessica Quarterman, Lisa McIsaac, and Shauna Lagenberger. And we'll just go to the second slide. So these are our disclosures, we'll let you read. Okay, so these are our objectives for today to discuss basic elements of a quality improvement approach, know who, where, and how to access improvement tools and resources, describe various types of journey mapping that we can done, done to understand the current state and understand the steps to executing a successful PDSA test cycle. So of course, um, before we start a quality insurance uh, presentation, it's really important to know what we all think quality improvement is. And so we'll have a look at the polling results. So it looks like nearly everyone said all of the above, that quality assurance is the right service for the right patient at the right time, service provided with the minimum amount of waste and rework. Um, it's how well we do what we do and how we improve what we do. So I think we would all agree with that. Thank you. So the next slide, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any comments during the presentation, we would welcome you to write them in the chat box. If you select all panellists and attendees, your comments will be publicly visible. And obviously, if you uh, want to include questions, they should also be put into the chat box. Or you can use the Q&A uh, button at the uh, bottom of the Zoom window. Or you can raise your hand and we'll try and get to you uh, live if we can at the end of the presentation. So next slide. So importantly, registered participants who attend this webinar will be able to receive a certificate of attendance. So please remember that at the end of the presentation. So most of this audience, I think by now know that the PEAS project, the Pediatric Eating and Swallowing Project is a provincial quality improvement initiative with the purpose of developing a clinical pathway to standardize and improve the care of children with pediatric feeding disorders uh, as de defined by the publication on the slide. And our target population for this project has been the ambulatory care setting, where we focus most of our resources um, on outpatient and community care, but these same resources can be adapted to other care settings, including acute care. Next slide. And I'm hoping by now that all of you are familiar with our PEAS website. Next slide. So I'm very glad to introduce Jessica Quarterman, who is a mum in southwestern Alberta, and she's here to talk about her journey with her daughter, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, later in this presentation, Lisa is actually going to show a journey map of Jessica's story and Brooke's story to illustrate how family experiences help us make improvements together. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us uh, join you today. We are very excited to get to be a part of this. Um, Brooke is here. She's in her uh, bouncer. So if you hear noises, I do apologize. Um, so our story is really long, so I'm really going to have to cut it quite short, but uh, Brooke was born at 24 weeks and five days gestation in December of 2019. So I was uh, only, yeah, 24 weeks, five days pregnant when she decided that she was going to make her grand appearance. So we live in Lethbridge, Alberta. Once uh, she was born, she was born here and was airlifted to Foothills in Calgary, where we spent the next 188 days in the NICU, uh, both at Foothills and Alberta Children's Hospital. So we spent a long time away from home. Uh, we were staying at Ronald McDonald House for our, our time there. And, and Brooke has overcome things that she should have never been able to overcome. And so uh, I'm happy to be here today to get to tell you about some of that, uh, some of that stuff. So um, from a feeding perspective, I think that's where we're gonna focus today. Um, but because she was born so young, uh, her biggest issue or one of our biggest hurdles was her lungs uh, and her ability to breathe or inability to breathe, I suppose, uh, which of course is a huge uh, part of being able to feed appropriately. And so 
uh, we, she was on a ventilator for three weeks. Uh, and then from there, she was on CPAP and high flow oxygen on and off for about five months. And then her last month uh, in the hospital, she was on low flow oxygen, which she did come home on. So uh, from there, uh, once she's kind of learning that suck, swallow, breathe ability, uh, we kind of got the okay to start trying bottle feeding, breastfeeding, you name it, we tried it. Uh, she did end up coming home on an NG tube. So her dad and I were uh, taught how to insert and uh, properly take out an NG tube, uh, which is where she fed at home for about four months. She was on an NG uh, before we got a hold of bottle feeding. So again, very, very quick overview of just how long we were in the NICU, all of the things that we overcame. Uh, so July 2020, she got to come home. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we finally get to come home. Uh, like I said, she came home on oxygen and NG tube. And at that point, she was also on nine different medications. She has two holes in her heart. She has pulmonary hypertension. She had ROP in her eyes. Uh, she, I think really the only thing that we didn't have issue with was her hearing, <laughs> uh, but it seemed like everything else we kind of had, had some hurdles to go through. So from there, uh, arriving home, we were followed by the neonatal uh, clinic uh, that was stationed in Calgary. Um, but of course, we were back home in Lethbridge at this point. So yeah, long story short, we have been through a lot of different things. And since we've been home, I think the toughest part has been just trying to navigate one, having a special needs baby at home in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, two, trying to figure out kind of what the next steps are for her and for us to ensure that her her health and her safety is, uh, is our priority. So uh, we have uh, a lot of different teams that we follow up with or that we have followed up with since being home and, uh, you know, dietitian, uh, speech language pathology, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, uh, eye clinics, cardiology clinics, oxygen clinics. Uh, um, there's a few more I'm forgetting, but they're long gone. So they're also long gone from my head. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things that we have had to had to go through, uh, of course, through all of this, but as well, just being at home, trying to navigate what it's like to kind of not have these things that not a normal newborn would have. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to really focus on and talk about was just, you know, the quality of care that we receive from everybody that we have come in touch with has been phenomenal. So we are very happy with that. What we're struggling with a little bit is the, I guess the, you know, not the lack of compassion. I don't want to say that, but, you know, we are coming from an incredible background and sometimes it just feels like we're just the next client. Uh, and we have a lot of different things that we have to go through and a lot of different pieces that need to connect that just don't quite fit together. Um, so things that, you know, are, um, you know, one clinician saying one thing, one doctor saying another thing, um, you know, once she was off the feeding tube, that was a huge milestone for us. Uh, but a lot of the feedback that we got from our teams was, okay, okay, when is she going to be eating solids? And it was a very like, well, we just kind of got off the feeding tube. So we're just kind of, we're happy here for a little while. <laughs> um, Right. So there's always kind of this push to keep going, which, of course, is the priority to kind of get her to catch up with her peers. Um, but we're also, again, trying to manage what it's like having a newborn um, with all these special needs um, and to navigate what that's like. So there was a lot of stress and a lot of pressure, I think, that we were kind of being pushed to do a lot of things, of course, with her best uh, interest in health in mind. Um, but, you know, to just be able to have our healthcare professionals take a step back and just, you know, be aware of where the families are coming from. You know, every family has a story and, you know, it could be your first time seeing this client, uh, the last time seeing this client or, you know, just a long term client that you're seeing. But we have so much more to our background. And I think that that's really important to take into consideration is just the 
the wealth of struggles that we have been through. And so when we're being pushed to be able to do more, um, we as the parents who, by the way, my husband and I have zero medical experience leading up to this, uh, this journey that we're on, um, you know, one of the analogies that I used, and I think Lisa, I'm sorry if you're going to use this in your presentation, was um, this whole, you know, coming home and going to, through all these clinics is kind of like a game of hopscotch, right? So we're going from place to place, we kind of have an idea of where we're going. But a lot of the times, we don't know where we're landing. So we we're, we're jumping and we're hoping that we're landing in the right clinic in the right place, seeing the right person. Uh, right now we've been home for, uh, will be a year next month, which is crazy to think about. Um, and we're still, we're still going through things that really could have been assessed um, in the time that we've been home. So uh, I'm due to go back to work next month. And so the time or the clock is really ticking to kind of get some things rolling. Um, but yeah, just really wanting to, again, thank you for letting us be here today, um, for having us be the voice of the, the families and really hoping that there's, yeah, anything that we can do to help to kind of to guide this quality of work, we're happy to uh, be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, so let's talk about quality improvement. My name is Shauna Langenberger, and I have the pleasure of presenting the next content portion to you today. So we've asked, uh, we've quickly asked you what is quality in the poll today. Now let's briefly talk about what is quality improvement. So quality improvement is a framework that is used to systematically improve the way that care is delivered to patients. It includes and paramount is that there is a focus on patient family um, customer. It's systems thinking. It's about the processes, not about the people. It's recognition that processes can be measured and evaluated for improvement. One key aim is to standardize, reduce variation and improve efficiency and safety. In healthcare, this should include evidence-informed and best practices, so that knowledge translation piece, and recognition that quality is not a start and stop project, it's about continuous improvement. The origins of quality improvement come from industry with a translation into healthcare as leaders began to recognize the value proposition for customers or patients and the need for improvements in safety and efficiency in service execution. As a society, we have transitioned Patients also evaluate their care from a customer experience lens. Again, um, all improvement work is centralized around the delivery of products and services to meet the needs of customer or patient needs, but it also means a commitment to creating a satisfying, efficient and sustainable work environment for our staff and healthcare professionals that work within these systems. So let's talk about improvement frameworks. So Tracy Wozlick spoke to us at the outset of the Integrated Learning Collaborative and talked about how the ILC has been adapted from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement or IHI. The model of improvement pictured here to the right is the quality improvement framework that IHI follows. To the left is our Alberta Health Services Improvement Way or AIW framework. This model of improvement was conceived with input from international improvement specialists. It incorporates several QI frameworks, so Lean, Six Sigma, Demaic, of GE Healthcare, and of course, the IHI model of improvement. The goal of this framework is that it can be used anywhere uh, and it supports any scale of improvement projects. So from clinical areas, uh, inpatient, outpatient, health, um, HR, facilities projects, it can be used on a small scope project such as improving a workflow around a focused daily task or major program redesigns. So I'm really encouraging those of you that are familiar with the AIW to stick with it. And for those of you who are not familiar with this framework to invest some education and training. I'll just, you can advance all the, the uh, animation there, thank you. 
So pictured here are the four major phases of the AHS AIW improvement model. Each phase flows, phase flows sequentially and is guided by key questions, deliverables that must be met before you can successfully move to the next phase. So briefly, first you define the opportunity. So what is the issue or problem? You wanna build understanding. What facts information do you require so that you, you know that you have a good understanding of what's really happening? Then next, act to improve, okay? So you understand what's really going on and now you have the facts and information to prove this. So how do you propose to fix the problem? And lastly, you wanna sustain the results. How do we make this change permanent and monitor to ensure that the solution continues to deliver the results that we want? As a team that will be focused on quality, what you need to know is that there are so many tools and resources that you can draw upon to support your journey. Each phase of the improvement journey uses specific tools and resources, just like changing a tire. So to be successful, you need to go through each successive step. Example, you need to jack up the car and use the tire iron and remove the um, roof the lug nuts before you can even begin to contemplate actually putting on the new tire. Through this process, safety and efficiency is always top of mind. Now let's look at a couple of tools in a short video that to show the execution of one of these tools working effectively at scale. So first, looking at, under the build understanding phase of your improvement journey, First, you need to be clear on what the improvement opportunity or root cause is. As healthcare professionals, we are natural problem solvers. However, in relation to process related issues, we often shift too quickly from problem identification to solutions. What we hear when those solutions are implemented are, why are we still having problems? Sometimes what you think is the cause, in fact, may be just another element or symptom and not the actual root cause. Our first tool is called the five whys exercise. You simply pick a problem and then start asking why, often a minimum of five or more times until you reach what is really at the core or root cause of the issue. Let's go through the example on the slide. So the problem is the patient uh, was late to the OR causing a delay. Why? There was a long wait for a stretcher. Why? A replacement stretcher had to be found. Why? The original stretcher's safety rail was worn and had finally broken. Why? It had not been regularly checked for wear. Why? There was no equipment maintenance schedule. Reflecting on this example, if in asking why you had stopped at any one of the first three steps, your solution likely would have been to purchase more stretchers. But as you can see, when we continue to ask why, the proper conclusion or root cause was a need to establish a maintenance schedule, saving dollars and likely needless ongoing frustration. Over you, Vanessa, to show this video. Years ago, the stone exterior was deteriorating at the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, DC, a popular monument in the United States. Repairing the stone or painting over the worn areas was too expensive. So park rangers turned to root cause analysis and started asking why. Why was the stone deteriorating? High powered sprayers were being used to wash the memorial every two weeks. Why were high powered washings needed every two weeks? Because of bird droppings. Asking why stopped because it seemed the cause was found. Workers put nets around the building but they were unsightly, and the birds found ways around them. So it was back to the drawing board, or the five whys. Why are there so many birds? They come to feed on spiders. Why are there so many spiders? They feed on insects at night. Why are there so many insects? They're attracted by lights that shine on the memorial at night. With a new cause found, questions stopped, and a plan was created to reduce the amount of time the memorial spent in the spotlight at night, and it worked. The insects were reduced by 90% and with the root cause removed, the excessive cleaning was no longer needed. An unexpected benefit was the cost savings realized by using less electricity. 
This highlights how root cause analysis can involve trial and error and how the five whys isn't always limited to exactly five questions. Read more about root cause analysis and the Jefferson Memorial story at the link below. Thanks. So such a simple tool being able to yield such effective results, right? And a lot of it is about questioning, having a questioning, editing an approach and involving the people that might know answers or have the information you require. Our next tool is called a cause and effect diagram or is often referred to as a fish diagram or an Ishikawa, its original Japanese name. As the picture reflects, you place the problem at the head of the fish and then engaging all relevant stakeholders who touch the process or problem, you then capture all the various causes that lead to the problem or effect. This may often and often includes engaging uh, patients and families. So as pictured here, you then take um, the causes that you obtain and you theme them in these various categories. So the categories, the standard categories are generally methods, which are processes, machines or equipment, people or manpower, measurement, materials and environment. However, feel free to create a unique category or theme if that works for your team. What I've included here is actually a real example. So if you go onto Visio, it's really um, easy to get a template that you can utilize with your teams. So this example is with Home Nutrition Support Program and is looking at the problem of uh, order processing for families. And um, these are all of the kind of causes that we came up with. If we zoom in here a little more uh, closely, what we can see then is the effect is inefficient or dissatisfaction with the current HNSP patient formula supply order process at ACH. And if we look under this order process section, I'll just kind of highlight a couple of key findings. So we know that the product SKU numbers change frequently are changed frequently by the CPSM warehouse, but there's no process of communicating these changes to HNSP. So orders are submitted to the warehouse with the incorrect SKU, causing work in transcribing or trying to match to the correct product. Another challenge, no process of communicating product or updating order forms directly to families. Another challenge, no process of regularly updating the formula list on the order form to match changes with the provincial formulary. So again, arriving at all of the causes, again, requires engagement of stakeholders. And the idea is, is you systematically address the causes or debone the fish, then eventually the effect or problem goes away. An, uh, another absolute requirement in examining current processes is reviewing them from a waste perspective. There are eight standard categories of waste inefficiency in healthcare. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll ask you to review this and watch the video that I've included in the link below at a later time, but briefly highlight. Um, so one example of waste is uh, waiting. Another is a sheer defect. So mistakes, rework, or just plain uh, bad process. And in healthcare, misused talent is a really big one. So you want to have the right person doing the right job at the right time. So although Justine Turner could likely be taught to book out patients, she is best utilized working within her physician scope. Having her book patients would reduce her available time to care for patients. This task is best done by clerks and admin. So again, looking at the processes that you map out and understand and ask and run them through these various ways. Shauna, one minute. Thank you. So this is what I call the base education for quality. R or results is equal to the quality solution times acceptance. This reminds us of the importance of change management, which is the key pillar within our AHS AIW improvement model. The simple message is, is in this equation is that you may come up with the most ingenious solution. However, if your colleagues are not in acceptance or invested in implementing the solution, you will fail. So our model for change, supporting change in Alberta Health Services is ADCAR. So A, awareness of the need for change is really important. 
de desire to participate and support the change. So you're going through each one of these letters and assessing. Do people have the knowledge on how to change? Then moving to ability. So even once you shared the knowledge, do they feel confident in the ability to implement their required skills or undertake the task? And lastly, we're, it's all tied to reinforcement and sustainability. So make it easy for people to do the right thing or change. Simply simple things like removing all copies of the old forms and replacing them with the current forms. Taking the time to orientate staff to new the process. Talking to those who may have still have questions or concerns about the new process. And then the presence of performance measurement and accountability systems so that you and sharing the results that you're achieving with a new process. Thank you. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Shauna. I'm Lisa McIsaac. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about incorporating the patient experience into quality improvement work, utilizing mapping. And I'd like to start out by saying thank you to Jessica. I'm really grateful for the time that you spent with me and, and enabling me to capture your story. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, the patient map that I created was not validated by Jessica. So Jessica and I had a phone conversation regarding the last 18 months of her journey um, after her daughter Brooke was born um, premature at 24 weeks and five days gestation. I would like to say that it's really important for um, us to have the ability to engage with patients and have them advise us on what their journey through the system is like so that we can see it through their eyes. There is no right or wrong way to um, capture this information. So it was really challenging at first because as you can see, the map is really busy and Jessica has quite had quite the journey with Brooke. Her experiences have been very complicated with the system and um, it, but it has given us um, the opportunity to see beyond our siloed thinking and um, to be able to look beyond the provider and the team to incorporate the patient experience into our understanding of what it's like for them to access the system. So like by looking at this map, some of the things that came up were really about the siloed work and the poor communication between different service providers and teams. And it was certainly clear about Jessica's frustration as she moved through um, the system, trying to gain an understanding about how to adequately care for her daughter. So as you can see by the icons um, with the multiple team members or the multiple people, that's indicative of multiple teams throughout Jessica's journey that she had to interact with. And um, there's lots of pain points. So at the bottom, there's some lightning bolts to indicate some of the pain points and the hearts capturing Jessica's um, direct quotes as I was interviewing her about her process. Um, this process involves a timeline in the middle. So the blue line down the middle, which is broken up into months and then the symbol of the patient that would be indicative of Jessica. And then the different bullet points along the way, we tried to capture month by month, um, her appointment times, the different teams and providers that she interacted with. Some of them were in person, some of them were over the computer. And as Jessica alluded to, um, it was frustrating. Um, oftentimes people would communicate with her as if, she was knowledgeable or had prior knowledge to what this experience entailed, but this was a new experience for her. She was a new mom and uh, she had no idea what was in store for her and there wasn't a very good plan of care or um, she had no idea what was coming next. So that was really frustrating. Um, one of the things that Jessica said to me that really stood out to me was that Professionals made her feel like she wasn't doing things right. And I thought that that was a really profound statement for her um, because as a new parent, you know, it's, you never really know what you're doing right. There's children don't come with a manual. So I can't imagine how much more complicated it was for her. And um, although it sounds like Zoom calls might've been quite convenient for her when she did get to take Brooke home, 
she said that managing technology, a baby, an NG tube, and oxygen was really, really challenging. So having to do all of that and juggle those things and somehow retain um, the communication that the service provider was trying to provide, I can't even imagine what that was like for her. So um, yeah, I hope I did a good job, Jessica, of capturing your journey on this particular slide. It was uh, very complicated and probably not completely accurate, but I think it gives a really good portrayal of how profound that journey was. And I tried to accentuate um, the really important times for you, like when Brooke got to come home, when she got her NG tube, tube removed, and the first time you got to see her face tube free, which I can imagine that was a really special day. So this is an example of a patient journey map. This is useful in giving us the broader perspective of what's going on throughout the patient journey. And it helps to inform us of how we can focus down and tune in on some particular aspects of the patient care to improve quality. We can move on to the next slide, Vanessa. So another mapping tool that we often use in quality is a swim lane map. So the swim lane map, is a cross-functional map and it's used to build understanding. So the purpose is to depict functional responsibilities and um, to summarize the process. Um, each different swim lane usually represents a different service and the patient moving through the service. So um, we can usually capture the patient's um, pain points throughout this particular map and look at um, department roles and help understand how the patient navigates that particular system. So in order to create a swim lane map, we first establish our process steps. We start and move from left to right um, and concurrent and shared steps should align vertically. And we usually verify, verify and validate the map with the patient. But as I said, I did not get an opportunity to do that with Jessica. So I'm hoping that it's relatively accurate and um, understand that the purpose of the mapping is to be able to articulate to people how we take the patient story and incorporate it into our quality improvement initiatives. So this particular map is um, the GI referral process that Jessica had spoken to me about. So Jessica, after she came home with Brooke, um, was referred to speech and uh, swallowing, um, sorry, swallowing group through um, speech and language pathologist. So if you look at this particular flow diagram, the first um, swim lane is the patient followed by speech and language pathologist, um, Alberta Children's Hospital, the pediatrician and South Health Campus. And this particular swim lane map is just depicting one simple referral. So um, when Jessica went to see the speech language pathologist, she um, did a swallow study and indicated that there were no concerns, but um, Brooke was having some issues with projectile vomiting and Jessica was really concerned about that. So the speech language pathologist thought that maybe it would be beneficial for Jessica to get a referral to a GI clinic. So the speech language pathologist, she then um, wrote a letter to the pediatrician recommending a referral. The pediatrician received the letter. He sent the referral to Alberta Children's Hospital for a consult. Alberta Children's Hospital received the referral, but they did not accept the referral. So if you see the, di the purple diamond in the middle of the diagram, that depicts a decision-making um, point. So they made a decision. To, de to deny the referral and they sent uh, the referral to South Health Campus. So upon doing that, um, there was no acknowledgement to Jessica as to why that particular referral was denied. And there was also no, um, no receipt of referral received from South Health Campus to indicate that they received the referral and Jessica doesn't know how to follow up on that referral. So currently she's waiting, that's the big yellow bubble. Um, she's waiting for some kind of response, for some kind of acknowledgement, and she does not know who the most responsible provider is 
who should follow up on that referral. So is it the pediatrician? Is it um, herself? Should she go back to um, Alberta Children's Hospital and ask them, hey, you know, are you going to follow up on the referral? Should she go back to her pediatrician? And if you think back to the patient journey map that I showed you with all the moving parts and all the different service providers that she's had to interact with, this was one simple referral. And the one question that Jessica has is, why is this so complicated? I guess there's two questions. Why is this so complicated? And why can I not self-refer? Next slide, please. Um, another tool that we will oftentimes use is a value stream map. And I'd like to um, say up front that value stream map can be very complicated. It's, um, it documents the flow in the process and the steps focusing on the customer and every single step um, along the way in any given process. Um, next slide, please. So value stream symbols and their meaning. They usually start with a supplier and uh, they end with an outcome. There's process boxes and there's lots of measurements in regards to like cycle times and time involved, um, the process time involved in obtaining a service or the delay in between an actual um, service received and like a referral or getting an appointment. So next slide, please. One um, minute, Lisa. Okay, so there's no intention that we would expect the teams to be able to do value stream mapping, mapping, but we really encourage teams to utilize value stream mapping in consultation with someone such as myself or with Shauna, who has um, experience using these maps. And the reason why it is important is because it gives us the opportunity to do a deeper dive into the patient experience to really understand the wastes in the system the redundancies in the system, and to um, focus in on tangible quality improvement work to minimize some of the um, pain points for the patient and to improve our service delivery and, our, and ultimately our outcomes. And this would be a completed value stream map process. Thank you. Back to Shauna for a summary. Thanks so much. So clearly a ton of value and a lot of learning that happens with the mapping. So th thanks, Lisa, for sharing that with us. And again, um, can't thank you enough, Jessica, for sharing your story and providing all the valuable content. But just to summarize, your first phase in identifying the problem and creating is identifying a problem, creating a problem statement. And the next you want to build that understanding around the problem. So uh, utilizing the root cause analysis tool, the cause and effect, mapping the problem, remembering to engage patients and families. And now you, now you need to, may need to tweak your problem or goal statement based on what you actually learned. And from the outset and through this entire cycle of improvement work, you're looking for the opportunity to create engagement. And at each phase, you're actively managing change, communicating with all of those involved, which includes your external stakeholders and patients impacted by the change. Now you want to actually select an improvement and do something to try and improve what's actually happening. So at ACT to Improve, we recommend, um, our recommendation is that you and your team develop a series of P plan, do, study, act, test cycles. I like to call this the try before you buy. A test cycle can be one patient, one day, one week. Um, it's far easier to engage staff and patients in a short trial before having to fully commit to the change. The Plan, Do, Study, Act test cycles were developed by the two fathers of improvement, Walter Schuhart and Edward Deming, originally called Plan, Do, Check, Act, and later changed to Plan, Do, Study, Act. In a PDSA test cycle, first you articulate the identified problem establish a goal, and now you're testing an intervention to see if it will make an actual improvement. In other words, you're generating a hypothesis about what you would like, what you think is required to actually fix the problem. PDSAs are meant to be iterative, so small multiple tests of change. Why? The philosophy around using small tests of change is based on the scientific method and the recognition that in science, the path to solving a problem is rarely achieved with the first test or experiment. So if you remember Edison, more than 3000 designs before the light bulb was a success. Not to say that you need to do 3000 cycles, but 
um, that small iterative tests of change is the path to successful and sustained change. I think you get the idea. The other point to emphasize is in reality, improvement work is not a linear upsloping journey, following a path of perfection. In reality, it looks like this, the bottom diagram. Again, by creating structure and effective planning around improvement, the journey looks like this, but you're learning and applying that learning the whole time. So go ahead, fail, fail often, but fail forward. Each test cycle is a learning opportunity. The other piece about conducting PDSA test cycles is that although it's, sim it's a simple concept, most improvement projects don't plan and execute test cycles effectively or correctly. Each part of the PDSA is important, especially when you're tackling problems in complex environments like we do in health healthcare. In my experience, one of the most critical elements is the P or the planning before the test of change. Poor planning can lead to a sense that the intervention is not helpful, which in reality has more to do with the lack of planning so that you could properly test the intervention. Haste makes waste. When you do this, you may be adversely impacting your change management plan around the intervention. Much frustration can result uh, if we let our impatience to make a big change stop us from following like a really good process around this. My advice is to start small, let your team feel some achievement with some success to help build confidence in the change adoption. Start small and celebrate each success. Change fatigue, in my opinion, has more to do with fatigue around poorly planned change. So what I've included here is a picture of the PDSA worksheet that's actually included on the AHS um, AIW website. So any team can download this. Um, and I'd encourage all teams to go through this form when they're actually filling this out. There's billions of forms that are downloadable from the web. And the IHI has a really useful handbook and form um, that I've included in your resource page. And so I'll have, um, now we'll go through an actual example and I'll just ask Vanessa if she can unmute Tom and Melanie because they participated in this in case they have any comments. So what we did here is they're interested in, um, in actually testing the oral care plan at the ACH Early Childhood Rehab team. And what they're trying to do is integrate the creation of an oral feeding care plan at the clinic appointment, and that this care plan would be up, updated at subsequent appointments. So this example, let's just walk through. So what we've included is the project title. We've included um, that this is test cycle one, and we've identified a start and end date for the test cycle. We've clearly outlined what the aim and objective is, and then we've gone below and specifically described the test of change that we're going to look at and who's actually gonna be responsible for testing that change. Next, um, you can see with the plan phase and I'll get you Vanessa, just scroll it up. You can see, look at all the line items that we've included. So starting with ensuring that a computer is accessible and available for each provider during an eating, feeding, swallowing visit with a family at Child Development Services. Um, we need to convert the actual form into a Word document so that it's uploadable on SCM. We need to make sure the template is located on the shared drive so that it's available to the providers. We need to develop the workflow and step-by-step -step processes. And again, we're identifying who's going to be responsible for that, when it's actually going to occur, and where the information be, might be required. So the devil is in all the details. I'll just ask you to keep scrolling up there, Vanessa. And so then what we're going to do is we actually going to predict what we think is going to happen, right? So we said, well, you know, we think parents will be really appreciative um, of this whole care plan. And maybe they'll identify that we're using some jargon or some words that they don't understand and maybe elements on the care plan that they don't value. And we fully expect that the providers may have some initial issues or challenges with trying to incorporate the workflow in terms of what they're doing. And then we're going to decide how we're going to evaluate or capture the improvements. So we're going to include a full measurement evaluation plan in terms of how we're going to do it. We'll actually have a date and schedule so you can see due. So then we're going to sit down with those people that were involved, actually capture what happened. 
um, study the results and the measurement, and then make a plan for our next test of change. And all of this information will be transparently posted on an improvement board. We'll be sending out um, communication as part of the planning, as well as developing a script in terms of how to share this with families. And I'll just invite Melanie and Tom, if you have any comments about going through this exercise, what that was like for you. Thanks, Shana. I, I really found that this was a very helpful exercise in terms of helping to um, really highlight all of the little pieces, you know, as you said, Shauna, um, being really thorough, being it, it, the, the, the devil's in the details. <laughs> we wouldn't have thought of, uh, you know, many, many, 80% of these little pieces if we didn't walk through um, kind of step-by-step with you through this plan. Um, and we have, I'm sure, many more details to fill in over time as we meet with our champions and, and our stakeholders, but just getting us into a mindset and a position where we're really ready, where we feel like we've really thought through the flow and the pieces of this was extremely helpful. So this has just been uh, a dance atop the mountain top, you know, mountain peaks into quality. As highlighted, your team may want to receive some further education. Um, we are certainly, I'll just get you to go to the next slide. Um, you know, lots of resources available through our AHS AIW. So if you're interested, please submit uh, an expression of interest to the email above, and we will certainly work on looking at providing some additional education for you. We put a ton of resources together on a slide and um, some of the links to the videos. So we'd really encourage you to go through all of those. Back to the team. Thank you very much. That's a great opportunity um, from, from the uh, quality improvement department. So I hope people avail themselves of that. And also just a reminder also to participate in our community of practice. Um, it's available to all healthcare providers interested in building community and so that we can all uh, collaborate together and enhance and improve our interdisciplinary practice in our shared field of eating, uh, feeding and swallowing. Next slide. Okay, so we are ready for uh, questions and comments. Um, well, so I'm just going to check if people can either raise their hands, uh, they can put their questions and comments in the chat box, and there is also a QA and a uh, portion as well, if that's easier for you. But I'm just going to start off, um, Shauna, I wanted to ask you that I, I think that that's very true, that um, it's wanting to change is an integral and part of improving or doing anything differently right and often that motivation to change is the hardest part and most of um, our peers members work in teams where maybe people are at a different stage in their readiness to change so how do you manage that when you're trying to do, uh, create a quality improvement project that works for all so as you, a lot of the tools highlight, it really involves engaging members of the teams and certainly, you know, Lisa's mapping exercise, you need to have the team members and the stakeholders. And that's where a large part of the engagement is actually built. Uh, people sitting there and listening to other people list those causes, people going through the steps in the process and going, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that that's what happened. Makes complete sense to me. So the idea of running through the gamut of those first couple of phases and the exercises and bringing people together, that's where you're building the curiosity engagement around the specific project and then encouraging and sharing about what you learned going, gosh, darn, we, you know, we, we were really upset with these individuals in the process because they thought they were trying to obstruct us. But we, we realized, as an example, maybe we weren't giving them the information that they actually required to be successful. And so I find in those early phases, that's where the enthusiasm is built and shared around the process. And again, we, we know it's not a perfect process. So there's, you know, lose any ego in terms of sharing the fact that we're not doing well. We know we're not doing well. But now what we've built is this great understanding. And often that's where the collaborative and goodwill is built to say, you know what, I'd like to be part of actually making it better. And I have, a, I have a question for Lisa and Jessica as well, really. I was really struck by the patient journey map that you, you showed. I mean, like what 
what an outstanding tool that would be to actually have for all our patients. Like, we, because the, the concern that Jessica raised about silos and communication, that's been a consistent theme throughout the PEACE project. Um, and I, I'm sure it is throughout all healthcare, but this is such a complex area and such a emotional and personal area that it's really important. So I just wondered um, in practice, Lisa, how can you do that? Because you're obviously skilled and trained to do a patient journey map and I'm sure it took you and Jessica some time to sit down and do that. But is this something that can be done sort of in real time and built, built on and added to and taken to every clinic and every provider to add to so that there is better communication? Can it work that way? Well, I think that uh, AHS certainly has intent to engage patients and to include patient advisors in um, our program councils and unit level quality councils to inform the work that we're doing. And I guess the, I mean, the answer would be, it would be unrealistic that we, that we could do this with every patient, but I don't think it's unrealistic that we can have patients like Jessica be involved in collaboratives that we do or, or help sit on committees or help us um, to understand their journey in regards to the work and represent other people like themselves so that we can have that expanded perspective and um, their feedback going forward. I mean, it's really essential in doing the work because when we sit in our silos, we don't even communicate with each other. And that's one of the problems that we see in healthcare all the time. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Jessica knows. Um, better actually what people are doing than we actually do, you know, doing the service delivery part because we're focused on the one piece of the pie and she's engaged in the whole pie. But I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. I'm sure she probably has um, some thoughts or feedback as well. Yeah, thanks. Sorry if you hear Brooke in the background. She just wants to be part of the conversation. Um, yeah, I think, you know, and it could just be a simple question of asking, you know, like, where have we come from? Um, I'm not going to sit down and tell everybody my, you know, hour long history of what it's been for an hour and a half uh, or for a year and a half. Story of you know like tidbits of what what's been a struggle for us. Um, so opportunity to have a five minute conversation with your client or your patient about what your main concerns are and why they're a concern, and even a little bit of their background. Um, it might help to kind of gear that conversation a little bit differently, rather than you know just staying with. in those silos, what's happening in each of those silos. And, you know, the patient, while not necessarily a, a healthcare professional, but could give that for their going through um, in that regard. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, PEAS has been trying to create some tools to help with that. Um, I, I was thinking one of them recently that we looked at was a patient goal wheel might help in that in some of that regard, though not completely. Um, but another question perhaps we could ask the attendees, uh, does anyone want to talk about some of the tools that their teams have been using? If we've got, we've got. So this might be a, yep, yeah, that's it there, the goal wheel. Thank you, Vanessa. It doesn't address everything that you said, Jessica, but it attempts to address some of like maybe, you know, what's what's might be an important goal at the moment, um, where you are in, in your journey at the moment. Um, so I don't know if there are any of the attendees who want to tell us about some of the tools that they might be using. Oh, here, and we while we're waiting, we do have a question. Okay. Uh, so can the PEAS ILCs access a QI consultant to help them decide which tools would be the most beneficial for us? So this is the um, learning collaboratives. Could a consultant attend one of our meetings? That was from Nancy. I'm not sure who that is directed at. Was that, were you gonna answer that, Vanessa? Kind of. 
Um, Nancy, I know you guys are in the central zone and we are absolutely happy to try to find someone to help work with you guys. And of course, um, we've got Shauna and Lisa who work in Calgary in the south zone, but at our next team lead meeting, which you're a part of, they're going to be there and are going to be available for some consultation as well. But then when we dig in, if you guys need some additional support, we can always look to help you. Well, and I was just going to say that quality exists in all of the zones. So there should be consultants that are accessible to you by your zone. And I would just look to your manager or your director for whatever program you're in and ask them, you know, if they are familiar with a consultant that's assigned to you or who you can talk to to access a consultant. I just see that Melanie has, there are some great tools presented today and how do you know which one to use first? So if you just kind of advance the slides, um, Vanessa. So um, right here, if you go to the AIW, um, AHS AIW thing, so uh, in terms of the phases, all of the tools and templates, they are free downloads to all of you and it gives you uh, a good sense. And again, by attending an AIW fundamentals, uh, you, you actually get you know, additional information in terms of exposure to more tools and which tools, and you can begin to uh, get some additional information that will help you select the correct tool. But then uh, coming out of those sessions, and, and again, if you've got enough improvement background that you feel confident, just simply go around, peruse. Each of these tools um, is a downloadable template and it comes with some explanation to help guide you and you can help figure out if that's the correct tool for you. Uh, just um, on this one, I've included a little picture of a, um, a priority matrix. So, you know, you want to act to improve. What do you do first? And so sometimes that's actually one of the big challenges. So just mapping out what some of the potential solutions you are in terms of this affinity uh, diagram can be helpful. So I call this the orchard of opportunity that I've created. So, you know, the fruit grows best where the sun is shining at the top part of the tree. So in this corner you will place interventions that the team feels will have high impact and high ease in term to implement. Again, at the top of the tree, but away from the sunshine, you're going you're gonna to put interventions that the team feels will have a high impact, but they're going to be more complicated. Lots more stakeholders, lots of moving parts, right? Um, now going back to the right side, here at the bottom, low impact, but high ease. This is where your quick wins go, right? That you can, things that you think you can implement right away, they may not have a huge impact, but they're quick changes that you can make. And a real quick win is something that you can implement literally in one to two days, um, informing like people directly and just make the change uh, right away. Sometimes that term is a little misused. And then going back to the other side of the diagram, low impact, low ease. These are the things that aren't gonna really make a difference and they're not easy. So just discard those ideas. So there's lots of comments and questions about um, the mapping. I think everyone really felt that that was very powerful and, and made it very clear what mattered to Jessica and her family. So there was a question that, you know, is there a tool that families can use to chart their journey that they could share with their healthcare professionals? And, and if there is such a tool, is it, when would we use it all? because obviously not necessarily all tools work for all families, but maybe if Lisa or Shauna know if there's any similar tool. Really the value of mapping is done as a group activity in attendance with the stakeholders hearing the message together. Really, so for a family just to document a journey and pass the paper to someone, I have to tell you honestly, it's probably just gonna get lost in the shuffle. So we hosted a large family journey mapping um, event here last week with our, uh, um, a number of our family advisors and an extensive number of our, our health care team less listening. It's really consolidating and creating that opportunity for families to contribute and bear witness. That said, within AHS, we value patient stories, which is why we have been featuring patient family stories at each one of our speaking and major events and activities so that we are constantly taking pearls 
and applying those pearls and keeping track of them so that they will inform our improvement journey. I certainly know I have been documenting the information shared um, in those family stories and I am so grateful for the families that have been brave enough to share their stories with us. And, and you do wonder if we included that more in our practice as, as a routine part of our practice, if it would help build teams and family collaborations even more, right? I, AHS does it as a much higher level than individual teams, but there's no reason why teams can't regularly include families as part of their, you know, their rounds and presentations, right? Um, so I think we're probably at the end of our presentation today, unless anybody else can see any other burning questions. I'm just checking the Q&A box. I think we answered that one. So I was curious about that last question. I know Jessica told me she created an Excel spreadsheet on her own to try to keep track of things. And I'm curious if she would have found it beneficial if somebody had provided her with something, some tool to map her own experiences as a parent. I'll also just mention, um, we do have some resources for families if you're interested on the PEACE website to vote uh, with a family health journal and um, the Can Child Kit, just so that people don't have to feel like they need to create something from scratch. I know Jessica. Hello. Oh, she's on mute. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. A lot of that that we created were really just mainly for our um, for us to keep track of her her feeding specifically like very specifically on that piece of things so um when we came home right we had to be keep track of how much milk she was getting when she was throwing up when did she get her medications um so yeah a lot of our document creation creation was on on keeping track of that type of information so yeah. all right well thank you so much to our panel and thank you very much to everyone who's attended today um, there is, as you can see, a survey so that you can share your feedback about the presentation today. Um, so I, I hope you will do that for us. And of course, please feel free to email us uh, any more questions or thoughts that you have about the presentation today. We will for sure follow up. And I think the last slide is just some resources from the presentation today. And the this will also be, will be on the website as well, Vanessa, right, the recording. All right, so thank you again, everyone, for your attendance. And thank you so much, Jessica and Brooke, just especially. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Yes, thanks, Jessica. Bye, everyone.